Hey everybody, welcome back. So I wanted to come on and add a little bit more to some things that I used to talk about a lot. I haven't done a lot of talks in the last, you know, nine months or so on kind of what's happening in our brain from like a neurophysiology perspective. If you have been listening to my videos or audios back when I started, so about a year ago, well, more like February, March, April of 2022, I did a lot of like what's going on in our brain, what's going on in our minds, um, kind of the neurophysiology and looking at the neurotransmitters and all of that. And so I won't go into all the details of that, but I've got some new information that I've learned that I think would, is, is a, for me, was a missing piece of the puzzle. Um, as I seek to understand the brain and the nervous system, uh, for me, getting education about it, understanding it has always been helpful in just trying to normalize a little bit of what's going on for folks. And I'll just, just to do a a really quick rehash, um, because again, you can go back and listen to those audios, but I talked a lot about, you know, the neurotransmitters, whether that's, you know, dopamine or serotonin or glycine or acetylcholine, um, whether that's um, GABA, or glutamate, whether it's the hormones, you know, in, in our body, adre- um, adrenaline and cortisol and norepinephrine, which is again, a, a, um, uh, uh, adrenaline, um, sex hormones, estrogen, progesterone, testosterone, those kind of things. All of these things are kind of floating around in our body that make us this nice chemical soup. And there's many more things than what I just named. But a lot of what we fo- focus on when we're talking about benzodiazepine withdrawal is we focus on GABA and glutamate. And, you know, there's a lot of different theories out there about what's going on. I don't know that anybody actually really fully has the picture, but the one theory that has made the most sense to me is not that we're lacking in GABA. So remember, GABA is the neurotransmitter that is our body's natural break. Glutamate is our body's natural gas, okay? And so you know, in theory, why we, as we're going through withdrawal, have so much uh, impulsivity, aggression, agitation, anxiety, panic, um, you know, uh, struggling with uh, with a, a whole number of things, right, is that we're, we're high, kind of high, in a highly agitated state. Our fight, flight, freeze, fawn response is activated, a lot of times nonstop. And so <clears throat> one of the theories is that the breaks, the GABA, <clears throat> is what is problematic. But there's some misunderstanding about this too. And this is what I tend to believe, is not that we're missing um, and we don't have enough GABA floating through our body, okay? The problem I think is the receptor. So for every neurotransmitter that you have, it has to go somewhere, kind of lock in a key. So if you imagine like GABA, the neurotransmitter in our body, uh, the chemical in our body is a key. And it's got to go around and find the right lock. And so throughout our body are these GABA receptors. And these receptors are the lock. So that key of the GABA goes in, it goes into the lock, and it basically unlocks the function of the brakes, right? Well, you have to imagine that our GABA receptors have had like somebody going in and pouring Coca-Cola and bubble gum and Captain Crunch and a whole bunch of other crap in them. And they've gotten kind of corroded and they're mucked up. So when that key, when the GABA goes in, it's not going to provide that function of slowing things down and, and turning on our natural brakes, okay? And that's why we talk about neuroadaptation has to happen in withdrawal. And that can take for some people weeks, for some people months, for some people years. It just depends on a whole host of factors as to why you know, why somebody can come off Xanax the first time and be okay. The second time, maybe those receptors are a little more jaded, um, or a little more corrupted. Um, and, and so it might be harder. It may take months or years to be able to kind of neuroadapt. So staying with that theory of these GABA receptors throughout our body, where these GABA receptors, they're all over our body, okay? Um, but they congregate and they're very densely populated in a couple of different areas. One is our retina in our eyes, one is our gut, and the other is our limbic system, which is a part of our brain that is really, really important because it's kind of the seat of all emotional processing and it's it's also the home of our th- our, our, our threat response system. So you've heard me and many other people talk about the amygdala being so primary in this. And the amygdala is that, um, you know, is that basically built in fire alarm, right? That we all have. 
and its sole job is to keep you alive. It does not care if you're happy. It does not care if you're satisfied. It does not care if you're content. It only cares if you're alive, okay, and it's keeping you safe. And so it would rather send off a thousand false alarms and get it right once, okay, and potentially keep you alive than, you know, stand down, okay? So it's very loyal, but it's not very smart. And what happens in benzo withdrawal, since these GABA receptors are so densely populated, and especially in this limbic part of our brain, which is the seat of our emotional processing, it, it does all these functions. And so our threat response system is constantly misfiring. And this is why we're getting these adrenaline surges, might we, why we might feel panic attacks. It's just general dis-ease and anxiety, fear, terror, chemical terror, and, and then, you know, because it keeps us in that sympathetic nervous system state, that fight, flight, freeze, you know, activation, activated state, it affects everything else. Our vagus nerve, our largest nerve runs through the back of our head, down into our, through our heart, our chest cavity, our stomach. This is why you feel anxiety in your chest and in your stomach, that foreboding feeling. Uh, it's one of our largest nerves. So everything gets affected by this, okay? So again, the limbic system densely populated with these GABA receptors that are not working so well for us right now and may not for a while. And so it makes sense then that in that limbic system with the threat response system being a primary function, that's going to be altered. But one of the symptoms that I've, that I've struggled with throughout my course of my time, and I know a lot of other people do as well, is this rumination, this inability to let go of something. And it kind of turning into whether we call it health anxiety or we develop kind of OCD, we maybe we have strange thoughts that pop in or scary thoughts that pop in or what ifs or if onlys or, oh my gosh, what if I don't heal? Um, you know, the need to seek reassurance a thousand times, the need to be on the forums researching the same thing a thousand times, just an inability to let things go, right? And that they're kind of held in worry, held in fear, held in terror. So there's a, a part of the limbic system that I've just learned about. I've never heard of it before. In 27 years of practice, I'd never heard about it. And I'm saying, I hope I'm saying it right, but it's called the cingulate gy gy gyrus. And it's cingulate, C-I-N-G-U-L-A-T-E, gyrus, G-Y-R-U-S. Not eros, like the, uh, like the sandwich, but uh, cingulate gyrus. And this is also a part of the limbic system. I'd never heard of it. Um, but I started kind of trying to research like what part of the brain is responsible for OCD just in people that aren't med injured. And this part of the brain kept popping up. So I started doing some research on it and then recognized it's also part of the limbic system. And the function of this part of the limbic system has several functions. And you can see how just like with the amygdala misfiring, right? Sending off danger flares all the time when there is no real danger, okay? Other than you know, there's been this, this problem in the brain um, as a result of the GABA receptors not being able to be utilized effectively and the brakes turning on. And I don't think benzo withdrawal is that uh, simple, but that's a big factor in it. But anyway, the sing going back to the cingulate gy gyrus, I'm just going to call it CG, okay? One of its primary thing things that happen when it doesn't work is that it when it when it's not working right, when it's misfiring, it gives it 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 does not allow people to let go of a thought, okay? Because one of its functions, one of its main functions is to um, provide what we call cognitive flexibility. Cognitive flexibility is that part of us that says, like maybe a thought comes in like, that person just cut me off in traffic, right? And being able to be like, well, maybe they're going to the hospital. Maybe there's something else going on. Or, wow, that person just ignored me. Well, maybe they didn't see me. Maybe they didn't hear me. Okay. That it's that part of our brain that can kind of generate options. It could be this, but it could not be this. And cognitive flexibility is really important because without it, we get into all these kind of cognitive distortions, black and white thinking, all or nothing thinking, catastrophizing, reading into things, and inability to let things go, aka rumination, right? And so I started looking at this and was realizing, okay, this makes a lot of sense that as our limbic system is really a huge part that has been, has been so greatly affected in this medication withdrawal or by this medication, the inability to let go of a thought, rumination, 
right? You take that to the extreme, you have like an OCD type picture. Then you start getting rigid and inflexible, right? Because all of a sudden, you know, that part of you, that CG, that's supposed to be able to like take a thought and let it go or take a thought and be like, yeah, it could be that or it could be 500 other things, right? Um, no, we don't do that. When, when we're impaired like this. We have a thought that comes in, we go right to catastrophizing, we go right to ruminating, we go right to, oh my gosh, worst case scenario, all or nothing, black and white. You know, I read 500 people healed, but I read about this lady who didn't heal and that's gonna be me, right? So there's this tendency towards the negative when the CG is involved. There's a huge fear of change, again, because change requires flexibility, and we get kind of stuck in this rigidity, and this inflexible behavior. Um, the CG also um, uh, helps us delay gratification. So a thought comes in, we want something, and the CG is kind of partly responsible for saying, yeah, that would feel really good, um, and I'll do that later or that would feel really bad and whatever. And so, but again, being able to kind of be in that emotional decision-making flexibility place. And it also, the CG also helps regulate pain and emotions and is a good predictor of negative outcomes. So it kind of helps us you know, make a decision, a good informed decision. So you can imagine if our limbic system is impaired, and this is a primary part of our limbic system, then all of its functions providing cognitive flexibility, allowing thoughts to come in and move past, generating options, being flexible and creative and delaying gratification, thinking outside of the box. All of that ability gets very compromised and we turn into rigid, inflexible, scared, um, you know, catastrophizing, ruminating beings. So I wanted to just bring this to your attention because as I, you know, I've known a lot about the amygdala, I've studied it a lot over the last couple of years, and it made a lot of sense for why I always, you know, in my in my own process felt a lot of dis-ease all the time or unease or, and then flat out fear and terror of anything, right? So I would always talk about the viewfinder, right? The view, those old timey viewfinders and, you know, basically, again, like our viewfinders are mucked up with dirt and sand and gum, right? So it's not what we're looking at that's so scary. It's that we feel fear. We feel scared because our amygdala is misfiring and we're in this heightened state. So everything we look at, past, present, future, an object, a person, a thing, can look creepy and scary because that's, that's the state through which we're seeing the world, Right. I've talked a lot about that, and that's kind of the amygdala. But getting to know the singular G rose and getting to know the this I'm like, again for lack of for time, I'll call it CG. It's made a lot of sense because I haven't been able to understand so much the excessive rumination that so many of us have, or the excessive worry, the negative going towards the negative with everything. Um, an inability to kind of generate options and be like, it could be that, could be this. No, we don't like that. You know, it, it's this, you know, and, and I have to know it's this so I can figure out what to do next. Like there's there's just not that that juice <laughs> flowing through us, right? That says, oh, yeah, let's, let's see. No, that doesn't work. Let's see delaying gratification, being flexible, being open, generating options, you know, um, no, we, we get incredibly catastrophic and ruminative. So this was very, very helpful in my thinking about, again, what's going on kind of within us that generates all, you know, many of these host of symptoms that we have. And then you can imagine if you just take that type of thinking and you apply it to anything, you apply it to a stomach problem that you're having or heart palpitations or dizziness or floaty body or tinnitus or whatever, you know, we're applying that thinking to that sensation as well. So now we have a body sensation that makes sense given the fact that we have a nervous system sensitization problem, right? So our nerves are the electrical grid of our body. They run everything. So now we're having these little physically, right? Not little, we're having these physical symptoms, but the way our thinking, the way that our limbic system is responding to pain, to emotions, to how we think about what's going on with us. You can see how it just goes literally from bad to worse, you know, in, 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 a, in a second. 
and suddenly we're, we're not in a reasonable mind. We're not in any kind of wise mind. We're in this emotional mind that's been hijacked by this limbic system that's kind of on fire and, and, and unable to access the brakes. Anyway, I hope this was helpful, guys. Take care.